Hey everybody, welcome to the January 2022 event for the Atlanta Kubernetes Meetup. This is our first meetup for 2022. Uh, we haven't seen everybody since back in November. I hope everybody had a great holiday season. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, whatever else you decided to celebrate. We're happy you're here with us. Um, as always, we like to open up with a call for hiring in the community. If your organization is hiring for uh, engineers or other roles related to Kubernetes or the cloud native space, working in that technology, go ahead and drop something in the chat. Uh, you can see there at the bottom of the Zoom interface. Uh, include some contact information, information about the role, um, and I will read those out after the news segment. I'll also include those in the show notes. Uh, so those will be uh, available for our watchers on YouTube as well in the, in the future. Um, and uh, let's see, hold on, sorry, I haven't done this in a bit. I'm losing my, my rhythm. Um, let's, I guess uh, my notes are messed up, sorry. I'm gonna go ahead and hand over to Joe for the news. My apology there. Cool. Um... I think I should be sharing out now. Hopefully that's a good size for everybody. Um, welcome back, everybody. Echoing a lot of what Alex said there. I missed the last meetup myself, so uh, it's great to be back in uh, 2022. So we'll kick off this meetup's news session for this month in Kubernetes uh, by starting with the Kubernetes 1.24 release cycle. We have the first alpha release that came out recently. Um, and the upcoming deadline for the 1.24 release cycle is the production readiness review that's due on January 27th. So um, if you've got any PRs open or doing any work upstream, make sure you get all your stuff done then. We did have a fix release that came out. Um, this is just sort of rudimentary updates uh, around performance and um, a, a couple regressions and things of that nature. Um, so one thing to call out here is that this is the last update uh, for Kubernetes version 1.20. Um, so if you're on Kubernetes version 1.20 or lower, you might want to look at upgrading. Um, again, here, just call out NA here. Doesn't mean that there wasn't anything promoted in the Kubernetes project, just nothing of note to bring out. Um, and one deprecation here, uh, QBDM removed Docker Shim support. So um, there's been a lot of work over um, the past bit in the Kubernetes project to remove a lot of the existing Docker shim support. Um, this is not removing support for Docker, the Docker runtime, just the kind of default shim layer um, in between. So everything is supporting the kind of native CRI interface now. Um, if you're running clusters that are bootstrap and deployed via kubeadm you might want to look up uh, some of this stuff there are a couple things you might need to do when you upgrade uh going forward one second here um uh cves there's been a lot of cvs in and about the technology community but i don't think there were any specific to the kubernetes project i'm sure everybody's been you know seen in the log for shell stuff and and a couple other things i think there was a new linux cve that was out today but um nothing specific to kubernetes i don't think um prs of note so one of the things that came to my attention that i thought was pretty cool is the reserve service ip ranges um so if we take a look at this, this is when you create a Kubernetes service resource, um, typically you're going to have an IP address uh, for that service allocated from a, a sort of default IP pool, which could be um, private class IP space, um, or if you're in a public cloud, it could be public IP space or your VPC space. Um, and typically that's gonna be automatically assigned from a pool of IPs configured per, on a per node level or uh, something statically assigned. Um, this new enhancement allows you to specify a range, a, a kind of separate range that could um, that can be pulled from for both dynamic and static IP allocation. So pretty cool there. Um, link to the cap on that if you wanna get into the really low level details of the design there. Um, one thing community news here uh, to call out is the kind of primary Kubernetes development mailing list has sort of changed uh, a bit. So um, it's going to be um, dev at kubernetes.io instead of the kubernetes-dev at Google Groups. Um, there's a link in here too. Um, but just notice that if um, you have any existing uh, things set up to pull from that or push to that, that you update your references there. 
Uh, one thing here is a uh, pretty cool YouTube video, I believe, if this is the one I'm thinking of. Uh, this is uh, Sounds like Kelsey Hightower kind of going through and talking about um, some of the background behind Kubernetes. I think there might be some other folks in there too, but really cool to kind of see, um, you know, uh, I mean, essentially a documentary on, on Kubernetes there. Um, if you haven't checked that out already, uh, it's pretty, pretty cool watch. Um, there is a, a proposal for a new API for job queuing, uh, which is interesting. There was uh, an existing proposal around uh, modifying the existing primitives around Kubernetes jobs and such. And this is sort of a pivot on that. Um, so it's not quite the exact same, but essentially um, adding additional functionality on top of the existing Kubernetes jobs API to allow for queuing to where you can create multiple queues um, and allow for some um, sort of uh, quotas and um, authorization for queue assignments uh, to be able to control who can push the what queue and different things of that nature. Um, so really interesting, um, you know, if you're doing batch workloads or anything like that, you can add some more intelligence of how resources come available and how things get scheduled when they're inside of a queue for jobs um, versus everything sort of just getting scheduled immediately or constantly polling to see, can I be scheduled now? Can I be scheduled now? Can I be scheduled now? So. Um, really cool um, design doc to read through, um, active work going on for this. And uh, the folks uh, behind this are looking for kind of uh, feedback. So um, if this is something important to you or you've got spare time, go check it out, read through it and uh, provide some feedback. Um, so this was an interesting thing for me that, uh, you know, there's been a couple really, really small, what I'll call underdog uh, enhancements to things that, you know, you, you kind of take for granted and you just put in the back of your mind like, oh, this is just how it works. But um, some of the stuff in um, on the client side with KubeCuddle, um, previously, there was a lot of work that went into being able to add the managed fields capability to kind of track ownership of individual fields within a resources specification. And that was great. There's a lot of reasons why that's useful to people. But when you run a kubectl git dash o yaml on something or, or whatever, you don't want to see all those managed fields uh, sections when you get back. So there's been work done in the past to sort of turn that off as the default. So now you have to specify a flag to get that stuff back. Um, this is kind of, I see it as a continuation of that sort of work where um, when you do a, a kubectl dry run command, um, Typically, it will generate things like the um, uh, the version of the, the resource version and the UID and different things like that, that most of the time when you're doing a client side dry run, you don't necessarily want those fields. And the first thing anybody does when they run a dry run is strip those things out usually. Um, so this sort of turns that off by default, um, which is pretty cool. Um, Uh, so this was an interesting project uh, that I came across, and I'll thank uh, my good friend Shahar, who uh, he was playing around with this on GitHub, and I sort of stalked his activity on GitHub to find this. Um, but this is the Octo CLI, um, and you might say, well, why is the CLI important uh, and, and relevant to Kubernetes? So essentially, my layman's uh, distillation of what this does is it's a CLI that allows you to interact with a, a database um, as if it's an API, a web-based API, a RESTful API. So you can expose data within your database um, as a web API using uh, serverless technologies like Knative. Um, and I think there's a there's a, at least uh, one other, yeah, OpenFast and Knative. And this is supported with Postgres um, Microsoft SQL Server and MySQL. Um, so it's pretty interesting. And the, the, the demonstration that they have here is essentially if you've got like a table in your database that has like users, you can define this, uh, use this CLI to generate this config. It'll automatically spin up your serverless function um, and then expose that data on a, a, an API route uh, where you can just go to slash get users and get the same data. So you can interact with it, expose a database to um, uh, a whole different group of clients that might not, you know, might where you might not want to integrate a hard, thick uh, database client to be able to interact with it and everything. So pretty interesting. 
Um, there's a good article on the Kubernetes blog around securing admission controllers. Um, admission controllers are uh, super important as a, a dynamic point of, of flexibility and extension of the Kubernetes uh, API in a lot of ways. Um, and especially these days, they tend to be an inflection point for implementation of various security tools, like runtime security tools. Uh, so making sure that the mechanism that enforces those security controls is secure itself is very important. Um, and uh, there's uh, Rory McCune from Aqua Security put this article out. Very good article. There's also a, a link to the threat model for admission controllers, which goes into a much deeper dive on like what exactly are the common attack surfaces from the entire admission controller um, uh, concept, uh, if you will. Um, so really good feedback in here. Uh, there's different points of this that we've touched on at different times in the past. And I'm, uh, I'm sure we might even see some of this in some of the talks later on today. Um, but yeah, if you're working in and around admission controllers, if you're building admission controllers, some good stuff to read just to make sure you've got it. Uh, uh, all your boxes checked from a security perspective. Um, and then there's another article on the Kubernetes blog about detecting, uh, detecting container drift at runtime. Uh, so this is a pretty cool. I've done a lot of work around admission controllers and I kind of regularly forget that you can look at admission controllers um, for more than just the Kubernetes resources that come through the Kubernetes API. You can look at them for like exec and attach commands to pods as well. Um, and so you not only can uh, apply policy and enforcement with that, but you can sort of introspectively look at like what commands are being interactively executed within your environment, which obviously has a lot of power. Um, say you don't want your users to be able to kubectl exec SSH or something like that. Um, this, this article kind of talks about a two-prong approach to where one, you have the admission control, the validating admission controller to sort of introspectively look at kubectl exec commands and allow or deny, but then it also has a mutating uh, web hook that can um, inject a label into pods where those commands, those kubectl exec commands are run. So you can kind of, you know, whether you want to inventory and track or report or, or whatever there, um, you know, you can add a label that says, you know, user X, you know, executed kubectl uh, exec SSH or something on, on this, probably an annotation, not a label for that amount of uh, information, but uh, you kind of get the point, hopefully, um, but pretty cool pattern, I think. Um, uh, check it out if you're in the security space or doing any type of development um, or just kind of want to look at uh, something else to put in your toolbox as you're working in and around um, Kubernetes in the SRE space. Um, and that sort of wraps up this month in Kubernetes from a news perspective. So I'll pass it back over to you, Alex. Thanks, Bunny. One thing we didn't mention that I didn't think quite was newsworthy, but uh, uh, is interesting. We mentioned the change around mailing lists there. We had we had to switch all of the Kubernetes mailing lists over to uh, mod approval for first uh, first message because of the waves of spam. I'm sure a ton of us received in our email on the mailing list uh, a week or two ago. It's an unfortunate change that had to be made there. Um, so on the hiring front, we've got uh, an interesting, interesting one. Uh, Mr. Roy Duvall is the CTO for Calendly. Uh, he's joining us here tonight. You can see him in the attendee list. Uh, he posted that they have a free role in their, uh, their GCP and GKE based platform team. It's a 100% remote role. Um, the link to that role as well as his email are both in the chat and it will be in the show notes as well for anybody interested in it. I can personally attest this is a, a great organization. It's a, a really fantastic role for anyone who's, who's looking for an SRE role. I'd highly recommend checking them out. Um, we just had another one posted. Sorry, I'm reading this live. It just came in. Um, they didn't post the organization name. Uh, I'm going to leave that one. I don't, it doesn't have the organization information. Feel, feel free to add the organization information there, Vasant, and I'll, I'll read it out uh, later. Um, so moving on from there, uh, before we, oh, sorry, they just posted, so it's Invoice Cloud. Uh, they're looking for a senior Azure at Terraform and Kubernetes engineer. Uh, again, their, their contact information is in the chat and will be in the show notes as well. Um, Moshe says there are a good amount of open positions at Sysdig. He posted the job link there as well. They, uh, for those that don't know, they do a lot of security uh, introspection 
around uh, Kubernetes cloud native technology, all BPF based stuff, very cool technology, another great organization I'd, I'd highly recommend. Um, so yeah, moving on before we uh, get to our speakers, as always wanna thank our sponsor. Uh, Salesoft provides uh, this webinar for us in, in these times where we've been all locked at home and give us the resources that allow us all to meet and have the nice technology to make this work easily. Uh, and better times they provide us space and beer and pizza and all those great things. Um, and you know we very much look forward to taking advantage of all that again in the near future, hopefully. Um, so uh, while our speakers are speaking, make sure to take advantage of the Q&A feature down at the, the bottom of the, the Zoom interface. You can put questions in chat, but we might miss them. It's better to queue them up in Q&A, and then at an oppor opportune time, Joe or myself will uh, read those to the speaker and they'll answer them. Feel free to go ahead and post your questions throughout the talk. Both of them have said that's fine. Um, and then uh, after the event, make sure to go ahead and stick around. We have an open social event. Uh, we'll allow everybody to turn on the cameras and mics and just kind of sit around and try to recreate a little bit of the social aspect of meetups. That's so important to all of this. Uh, and with that, I am going to go ahead and introduce Mr. Parth Patel. He's an engineer at Voxboat. He's going to be talking to us about building secure supply chains with Tekton chains. Go ahead. Thanks, Alex. All right. So I'm going to share my screen. And all right. Change this to laser. Yes. Hey, uh, hey everybody. Um, good evening. Uh, you know, I'm glad to be here and talk about uh, Tekton chains today. Uh, so it's just a little bit about myself. Basically, uh, I'm a DevOps engineer right now at uh, Built uh, Boxboat, and uh, you know I've been working with a lot of open source technologies um, and contributing, especially to the Tekton project, as specifically Chains. So that's why I want to come come to this meetup and talk about it and show kind of like, hey, what it is, how can it be used, and you know what are the benefits of it, and what are the other pieces of Tekton because Tekton is kind of it has a lot of different projects underneath it. Um, so I think. Uh, so let me get started on that. Um, so starting off, you know, Tekton is a cloud native CI CD system. You know, you can use it to build pipelines in the cloud, you know, in any cloud provider or on-prem. Um, so it's very versatile and, you know, kind of walk through what, what is exactly Tekton, you know, what does pipelines consist of and all that kind of stuff. So, so going forward, um, like I said, you know, Tekton is multi-part. There's a lot of different projects that kind of branch off of it. Uh, the first piece is the pipelines, the Tekton pipelines. This is the actual CI CD system, you know, that consists of tasks, task runs, pipeline, pipeline runs. And in the coming slides, I'll show you like a quick example of like, hey, well, how does this look? Uh, they're basically custom uh, uh, resource definitions in Kubernetes. They run right in uh, cloud nating uh, form. So they run in the Kubernetes cluster and kind of walk you through the structure of the tasks, the pipelines, uh, you know, how is it run and all that kind of stuff. Uh, the CLI uh, specifically is basically just a command line tool, right? If you want to interact with the Tekton, you know, your Tekton pipeline that's running, um, you can use a CLI uh, so that you can view the, 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 you can view the pipeline, you know, initiate the runs and all that kind of stuff. Um, for the dashboard, you know, if you're more, you know, visually, if you want to uh, utilize more a web interface, and uh, that's where the dashboard comes into play. Uh, you can do the same things you can do with the CLI. But uh, you know, visualize, run, all that kind of stuff, but in a nice GUI interface. Uh, the catalog, uh, I'll talk to uh, talk about more in the coming slides. But basically, it's just a collection of different tasks and pipelines that have been pre-created by the community. So it's a very great, great, uh, great place to start. And, you know, if you're new to Tekton or just you know you want some kind of a task and you kind of want to modify it later on. Uh, and of course, the last piece is chains. You know, which is the the piece that I'll talk about the most. We'll do the signing and. Uh, all the provenance and all that kind of stuff. So starting off, um, just a quick example of what, what is a task. So on the left side over here, you can see uh, this defines a task and a task can have multiple different steps within it. So the first one basically uh, is, is this the builder is using, you can see exactly what image is using. Um, so it's, in this case, it's a my builder image and then what arguments that get passed into it. Uh, so a task can be reused multiple times. So that's it's very uh, reusable because of how it's designed. It takes in multiple different parameters, and these parameters can actually get passed into the actual steps. And uh, a task can have multiple steps. In this case, it's only one, but it can have multiple different steps within it. And these parameters would be used to uh, fill in the different, you know, the flags or whatever else is missing in here, so that um, this task can have multiple usages. You know, let's say for example, this some URL changes to a specific. Git repo, um, and every time it changes, you know, maybe some kind of a different image might come out. So that's uh, that's a task. Uh, so on the right side, but in order for a task 
to actually run um, individually, you have to specify these parameters. So that's where the task run comes into play. And you see uh, it references the task. Uh, so in this case, it's a task with parameters. So that's right here. It references that a name, uh, the task by name. And then of course it passes in those specific flags that were uh, called out in that task. So this task run would initiate, would pass in these parameters and then initiate this task to run. Um, going forward. Uh, so the next piece is the pipeline. Um, you can see on the right side, or sorry, on the left side. Um, again, it's kind of similar to a task, but it's, you think about a pipeline, right, as, um, as a multiple of multiple different tasks that are put together. And down here, you can, again, this kind of looks similar to that task run before. If you see, it references a task, a task name again, and of course, passes in different parameters. So a pipeline can have multiple different tasks associated within it. So you can have multiple tasks, each referencing a different uh, task that's out there in your cluster. Uh, and again, a pipeline is meant to be reusable, right? So you can have all these parameters are configurable. So you can actually change, you know, add in the different contexts or different flags that you want to. Um, and so in order to do that, that's where the pipeline run comes in. Similar to the task run, a pipeline run, right? References the pipeline in this case, and it passes in the different parameters that were missing before. The one piece that's not shown in here is uh, workspaces. And I'll, uh, in the coming demo, I'll show you that uh, in action. But basically, if let's say you have multiple different tasks in here in a pipeline, and for the first task, create some kind of a object that the, uh, the, the task below it ingests, right? So how, it's basically, it's a shared workspace that it can um, store that specific artifact, whatever it creates in a specific task and then be reused by the second task that runs after it. So like I was talking about before, uh, the Tecton catalog is a great place to get started. And I'll show you like the example that I'm gonna be using here is gonna be the build packs example that comes from the catalog. So it's, it's very useful just to get started. Uh, it has a lot of different tasks and, and it's, you know, like you cut, if you're new to Tecton, it kind of allows you to create your own pipeline. But at the same time, you know, if you're advanced, you can look at the different tasks and modify the task based on your needs and then, you know, make it easier than writing it from scratch, basically. The dashboard, and I'm going to show you this in a demo also, but like I said, it's, it's very uh, user friendly, you know, user interface, uh, you know, kind of shows you all the different components of Tecton the pipeline, pipeline runs, tasks, and all that kind of stuff. And uh, you can actually visualize, you know, what's happening in your in your pipeline or pipeline run, what's, what each step it's going through. It'll show you logs. You know, if, if it fails, it'll give you the log, you know, the, the failure messages and all that kind of stuff. And again, we'll see all this in the demo coming up. And of course, the last piece, uh, the most important piece uh, is the, the chains, right? So this is the one that's actually going to be doing uh, change kind of runs at the end. It kind of it's, it, it observes the pipeline as it's running and it kind of waits for the tasks to finish. And then once the task actually finishes, it uses the, uh, it can actually sign uh, the task runs themselves and also the images. For example, if you're using Canico or if you're using build packs or something that creates an, an, an image, right? Um, Tecton chains will automatically sign that with the cryptographic keys that you provided. Uh, it'll also create uh, specific provenance documents or uh, uh, based off salsa and I'll talk a little bit more about what salsa is in the coming slide uh, so you can do signing with very various uh, various cryptographic keys so it supports uh, you know different key MS and um, so it's very easy to uh, integrate with different uh, cloud providers and such uh, the last piece actually this is the one that recently came out in 0 0.7 of tecton chains which got released last week I believe um, it's a PR that I actually recently uh, introduced was this one that added multiple storage backends. Basically, th what this allows is that it can, uh, I'll show you this in the coming slide in the configuration file, but basically uh, you can store in both, in multiple different locations. So for example, let's say uh, you can store it as an annotation in the actual task run object, or you can store it in an OCI registry. So this way you have backups. So in case, you know, for some reason your cluster goes down or something, you kind of lose all the objects. Um, then you still have a backup in either OCI or you know uh, Google Google Container Store or Google Storage or whatever else kind of thing. Um, and then in the future releases that's being worked on right now, it's going to be uh, Spire integration, and that's going to help us with the non-falsifiable falsifiable provenance. So what is Salsa? Right. So Salsa is a supply chain levels for software artifacts, and there are four different levels. Um, so the first level, right, is the to build out in a fully scripted, automated way. Um, and, and create some kind of an unsigned provenance. So Chains already helps you establish this, right? Actually Chains helps you establish level one and two. 
So first, pipe, first the, the Tecton pipelines is fully automated. And if you introduce change with it, it's going to create this provenance, uh, you know, provenance file or document that's going to um, be signed in our case, but the first level just talks about being unsigned. The second piece is where the signed provenance comes into play. And that's, you know, Tecton Chains is uh, automatically signing that provenance for us. And it's, uh, you know, it's already version control because you can, you can have it running off, uh, you know, your, you can store it in, um, because they're CRDs, right? You can store them in, in some kind of a repo, a Git repo, so that's version controlled and all that kind of stuff. Uh, the, third uh, the third level, that's that non-falsifiable provenance, right? And security controls on the host. So that's where, uh, that's where Spire is gonna come into play. And I think it's, it's a little bit out of scope for this presentation, but basically it's like having Spire there kind of, you can have attestations that, hey, yes, I trust this host that I'm running on, but at the same time, I, I, I trust that whatever workload that I did, I trust that also. So it kind of does attestation to prove itself uh, for that, that workload and having that integrate with, with chains and pipelines. So that work is being, being done right now. So eventually change is gonna meet uh, level three. And then level four is, you know, two-party reviews and hermetic builds. And this is still a little ways in the future. So that's hasn't been completed yet. So the, how does this also provenance, you know, how does that get created and stuff? So basically, uh, you know, it's, it, it uses some kind of a builders. In our case, our builder, um, our builder is Tekton pipelines and Tekton chains in our case, right? Uh, so it produces some kind of an artifact. So that software artifact is going to be, you know, let's say, uh, a, a Docker image or something that we push to an OCI registry. Um, so how is that being created, right? So it takes in specific parameters, it takes in specific materials, it takes in, it maybe takes in environment variables, all that kind of things. And it kind of executes all those um, and creates that object for us. So what the provenance wants to show us is how was that software artifact created? Um, so specifically, Salsa supports in Toto format. And in that format, it kind of gives you, you know, gives you the specific information, hey, what was called in order for that image to be created? You know, what parameters were called, what environment variables, what materials, what everything, everything that, that got used in order to create that final artifact. How was that created? And that's what it kind of gives us that information. And I'll show you that in the demo, like an, an actual uh, a provenance document, what it looks like. So uh, one of the things that Tekton Change has a lot of configuration. Um, the main important piece that I wanted to cover here is the uh, artifacts task run format. So this is a specific format that uh, that chains will create your provenance uh, file in uh, and document in what kind of format. So specific, by default, it goes to Tekton. But like I was saying before, uh, to be Salsa compliant, it has to be the Intoto format. So that's that's why we'll change this uh, to be Intoto. And you can see down here, you can just patch the config file and uh, you know just make it Intoto. And we'll do that in the demo. Uh, also, the other piece was the Tekton, um, you know, the task run storage. Where do you want your, you know, your provenance and your signature and all that kind of stuff stored? So by default, it sets to Tekton, Tekton. So that's going to be the annotation in the task run itself. And that's in that object, uh, Kubernetes object. It can also be the OCI registry. It can be, you know, Google, uh, Google Cloud Storage and DocDB. So with the recent release, you can actually multi uh, uh, specify multiple uh, backend storages, right? So you can specify both the Tekton and OCI. So down here, you can see that's what we're going to be doing for the demo. So we're going to have restore it into an OCI registry. At the same time, we'll store it as an annotation. The one piece uh, that's currently needed is uh, it, there's two parameters basically at the end. So for for example, if you're if your your uh, task, you know, if it, let's say it's Canica or build packs or something, it's creating some kind of an image, and you want that image signed. Um, you need to include image underscore URL and image underscore digest. So these two, two results uh, need to be included in your task itself. Uh, that's actually creating your image. Um, if you don't include that, it'll, chains will not actually go in and sign that image. Um, so you want to be careful when you're actually picking out some of these tasks that you want to check that this image underscore URL and image underscore digest actually exist in that task that doing, that's actually going to be outputting an image. Otherwise, change is not going to pick up that and sign that image. It will still create a provenance, but it will uh, not do the signing. And um, the build tax example I'm going to show you uh, in the catalog currently does not support that, so we'll fix that. Uh, so one of the tools I'm going to be using here is a uh, cosine, um, which is I believe it was uh, uh, talked about in the previous uh, meetup. But basically, we're going to be using that in order to 
and it can be used for to do container signing verification uh, and then of course storing all that stuff into OCI and verifying it from OCI. So uh, in our case, what we're going to do is Chains expects a, a key uh, a secret uh, that's called a signing secret and it's usually stored in the, uh, the Tecton chains Tecton chains namespace. Um, so what Cosign is going to do is going to create that for us automatically. So all we got to do is just run Cosign generate key pair and it's going to you know you specify the uh, the namespace and the, the name of the, sign, the secret and it'll create that for us and change will automatically pick that up and use that as a signing secret. And like I was saying before, you can, you know, you can use KMS and other stuff if you needed to, but just to make it simple for the demo, we're going to use a cosine command. Um, so in, installation is very easy. So I'm not going to run through the installation in the demo, but it's, it's, you know, just, uh, it's all open source. You can go to GitHub and, you know, download all the uh, release.yamls and have everything installed quickly. Uh, both for the pipelines, the dashboard, and chains. Uh, to install Cosign, you know, you can install it using Go or you can install it using Brew. Um, or, you know, just if you, uh, if you want to just get, grab the binary and get it onto your system, that's another way of doing it. So let's just jump into the demo. So what I'll sh show you is, you know, how is that signing secret get created by Cosign? So we'll do that first. Uh, and then we'll talk about, hey, what, what is the build packs? What does the example look like? What is it doing? Uh, once the actual pipeline actually finishes, the build packs pipeline finishes, review that, that, that provenance, the attestation that's, that gets created. Uh, and then finally, we'll do, we'll use cosine. Like I was saying, cosine can verify the image and the attestation. So I'll show you that coming up in the demo. Uh, so like I was saying, um, the build packs example that's in the catalog currently does not have uh, the necessary field on uh, image underscore URL and image underscore digest. And actually work has been, work is being done. Actually, I just put a PR in recently, but there's like, there needs to be a major overhaul in the, the catalog so that that every task in there that is maybe creating some kind of a software artifact, it's chains compliant. So right, it, it includes this image underscore URL, image underscore digest. Um, this is the way that change is currently doing it. So maybe that might change in the future and maybe we no, may no longer need this uh, URL and digest, but in, in uh, the current release, we do need that. Okay, so jumping over to the desktop. Um, so here on the uh, left side, I have the Tecton dashboard running. So you can see here's the pipelines, pipeline runs, uh, pipeline resources and conditions are actually gonna be deprecated soon. So we can just ignore those for now. They haven't, they haven't been removed from the latest release of dash, uh, Tecton dashboard. Uh, task, a ta cluster task and a task run. So the only difference between a task and a cluster task is that task is specific to a namespace, whereas a cluster task is, uh, right, as, a, as any cluster object would be, is cluster-wide. So it's not tied to a specific namespace. So you can use an, you can use a task in any kind of namespace you want to. Um, so that's the only difference between those two things. And we talked about the other stuff. And then this piece I want to bring up really quick is that Tecton catalog or the te Tecton hub. Um, so in here, you can see that there are multiple different tasks uh, uh, for example, there is the one of the ones we're going to be using in this uh, in the coming demo is a git clone, right? It's going to, it's going to clone down the uh, repository we're going to be using, um, and then down here I think there's there's a Canico and all that kind of stuff, maybe. So a lot of a lot of different examples uh, already in here, so it's it's very easy to get started. And then there's also pipeline examples. So the specific one I'm going to be using is this build pack example. Um, you can see, you know, it takes in so basically, here are the three different tasks, that, three different tasks that it takes in: the Git the clone task, the build packs task, and then this build phases task. And I believe this last task is actually used to create those unsigned images. So in our case, because we want it signed, it's only going to be running these two specific uh, specific tasks. But in order for the pipeline, because the pipeline defines all three of those tasks, uh, we would, we're going to install all three. But you could, you know, if you wanted to, you could just edit out the pipeline and just remove that. So let's take a look at the pipeline itself. So here's the build packs pipeline. So it's the pipeline's object. Um, here is that workspace I was speaking about before. So this is that shared workspace between the different tasks. And usually this is like, you know, it can be a, a empty dir or it could be like a PVC or something in Kubernetes that kind of shares, you know, like a shared space that a task can use or you know, in this case, the images can use to send information between each other. Um, 
here are the different parameters uh, that this, this specific uh, pipeline takes in. You can see there's a lot based on the small example that I gave before. Um, some of the parameters are like defaulted. So like, for example, this source reference defaults to an empty string, right? So you don't have to specify that uh, when you want to do a pipeline run. But, you know, for some of these, for example, the source URL and app image, right? Because it needs to know, hey, what do you want to build? Um, and once, once the image is created, what do you want to call it? And like, where do you want to store it? So that has to be passed in, right? So that's why those are not defaulted out. So those have to be passed in in order for the pipeline to actually run. And down here, uh, the specific tasks are called out. So here's that git clone, like I was mentioning before. And then the next one references the build tax itself. And then the last one is the build, build fax phases, but it, that one creates an untrusted image. So in our case, it's not gonna run. Um, we're just gonna be running these first two different tasks. So if I wanted to, I could just go out and just get rid of this last piece, right? Because it's, it's not important to my uh, build pipeline, uh, but in, in the demo cases, it's gonna run. Uh, so one of the things I want to show, so like I was saying before, the, the build packs, so right here is that version 0 0.3 of the build packs task, right? So I have that open right here. So it's 0 0.3 build packs uh, dot YAML. So this is the actual task, right? This is the, this is the type of task in Tecton. And you can see that it's missing down here. You can see that it's missing that underscore. So it has the underscore digest, uh, image underscore digest, but it's missing underscore uh, image underscore URL. Right. And that's what changed those two parameters. That's what it looks for. So there's two different results right there have to be added in there. So there, I think in the PowerPoint slide, I linked this, but basically there isn't, there has been an update uh, in the build tax repository, but hasn't been updated in the actual catalog. So this is 0 0.4 of the same build tax uh, task again, same thing. Uh, all the parameters are still the same. The only thing that changes here is yes. Now you see there's a uh, image underscore digest, as well as an image underscore URL, the two things that change needs in order for it to sign that image that it's gonna create at the end. So we're gonna be using this image. Um, we're gonna be using this task instead of this, uh, the ones that's, that's called out here. So we're gonna be using version 0 0.4. So getting started um, on the right side, uh, my terminal, you can see in my current cluster, I have the Tecton change controller running. I have the dashboard running, I have the uh, pipeline controller running, and then the webhook running for the pipeline. Um, and this other tab, I, what I basically did is I just have a, a port forward uh, to zero, uh, 9097 for the Tecton dashboard. So that's how it shows up here as a local host uh, to that port forward, basically. So it makes it easier to visualize in a demo to see exactly what's going on. So like I said, the first thing we're going to do is um, we're going to generate the uh, you know, the generate the key pair, the signing secret that change is going to use. So all it's going to do is, you know, like, like in the slides before, is it's going to run this cosine generate key pair, and we're going to get that uh, secret created for us. So I'm just going to put uh, no passwords in, and it's going to create that secrets in the Tecton chains namespace, like it says, and it also gives us a gives us a public key back out. So the next piece I'm going to do is, uh, remember I talked about by default, it uh, it defaults to, uh, sorry, I think my uh, screen is not full. There we go. There we go, okay. So uh, by default, uh, it changes the, when, when Tecton is installed by default, the format is gonna be in the Tecton, the default Tecton format. And then of course the storage is gonna be Tecton by itself. So we want to change those two things. So I'm going to change it to the in total, right? That's salsa compliant. And I'm also going to change it so that it stores it in both OCI, the OCI registry that I'm going to push the image to at the same time as an annotation to the task run that's going to be created. So I'm going to run this and it's going to do an edit. Uh, so in my case, I think I already had it set to those. So you can just take a look. So I'm just going to, you know, just do an edit on this just to visualize it. So you can see the format is actually changed to in total and a task is set to OCI and Tecton. So next, uh, we're gonna install those, those tasks uh, that the uh, pipeline needs in order for it to run. So that's gonna be git clone, build packs, and the build pack faces. And right, like I was saying before, we're gonna be using version 0 0.4, right? We wanna use version 0 0.4. You can see that right here because that has that specific underscore, image underscore URL that's missing from the results. So running this. So it creates, a, it creates that in there. So we can actually come back to the dashboard 
And now you see those three tasks appear. So you can actually click on it and you know you can visualize uh, see the YAML that's you know that that's the the task that's you know that we just added in there. Uh, later on you'll actually see the actual pipeline and stuff running. Okay, so next, uh, like I says in the dash or uh, in the catalog, uh, the next piece is we have to install the pipeline, right? So this is that this this build pack dot YAML that uh, is the actual pipeline object. So that's where we're going to be actually installing next. So if I just do a, a cat on that, so you can see that this matches up with the 0.1 build text .yaml. So that's this right here. So let's run this. And you can go back to the dashboard and just make sure it's there. And yep, it's there. And again, you can visualize it. You can see the YAML behind it. Uh, the last piece we're going to be doing is uh, uh, we're going to, we have to specify the pipeline run, right? We have to specify the pipeline run and the PVC, right? So the, for starting off with the PVC, the persistent volume claim, uh, remember I was saying it needs this in order for the uh, the pipeline to, and I don't know why this is, there we go. Um, down here, you can see the workspaces and in order for the workspace to, right, it needs a shared workspace. Uh, so we're gonna use a persistent volume claim and and that's what's defined up here. So basically having this is going to be our shared workspace between our different, you know, our Git clone and build packs uh, task in this case. Uh, and then the last one down here is using an uh, empty directory uh, for this cache one, because it, in this case, it needs this in order for it to, um, so it looks like this, this pipeline specifically needs it. Otherwise it hangs in this example one. Uh, the other piece that we want, uh, we want to talk about is that the parameters, right? So what are we passing into this pipeline? So we can go back up to this and we can see specifically, right? We're referencing the build packs uh, pipeline here. And then, the, you know, what what builder image are we gonna be using? Is this gonna be a sample builder that comes with the uh, a stored in Docker Hub um, that comes with the example uh, in, where do we wanna store this? So in this case, I'm storing it to ttl.sh. Um, I'm not sure, I'm sure many people in the have, have used this, but basically it's just like, a very easy, like you don't have to authenticate to this uh, registry. And it's very easy, for, especially for like demo and test purposes. Like, you know, if you don't care, if you're doing something non-production related, right? And just for demo re uh, reasons, you want to push something and pull something down quickly. Uh, this ttl.sh is very useful in that regard. So basically I'm just going to store this web uh, webinar demo nine uh, image into that ttl.sh registry. And then it's going to pull from this build pack samples. This is going to, you know, build some kind of a, a Ruby image um, that's part of this in this GitHub repo. So to do this, I'm just going to do a uh, apply so that it takes that object and applies it. Right. Um, so it's going to create that. So it creates a PVC and it's going to create the pipeline run. So we come back over here. We can see uh, the pipeline run actually uh, got it. So pipeline run uh, successfully got imported and it also started running the pipeline. So right when I did the kubectl uh, apply, it started running right away. And you can see the first task, which was that git clone task has already been finished, right? It's gonna take that, go to the Git, uh, github.com, you know, that repo, the samples, a sample example, it's gonna go to that and clone it down. And the next piece is gonna start, you know, build packs is gonna run. It's going to start uh, going through it. So you can see the different parameters, what parameters got passed into the specific task. It, got, it gives you that visualization here. You know, so like I was saying, here's that app image there. You know, what, what was the image subpath that it has to go to? It gives you status of what's actually happening. Um, you know, this is the specific uh, conditions that are passed in there. And then let's say for the pod, you know, what what is the pod doing? And there's, I think there's events in here. Um, I think the main thing we want to look at is the, uh, so it's it's done. So the main thing we want to look at is the results at the end, right? So these are two things you specified, if you remember, uh, for chains, right? Image digest and image URL. So those are two important pieces. So the pipeline ran successfully. The last, right, the last task is not going to run because we're not going to create an unsigned image. So that's why it's not running. So going in, so now that it's completed, so we want to go in and uh, take a look. So, but before we do that, I do want to show you a quick example of what the, the, the Tecton CLI looks like. So you can see it up here. Um, I'm actually using it. So if I copy this, so this is TKN. Uh, so what this command basically is doing is TKN, give me the last, describe the last pipeline run in this case, right? So if I do that, it kind of 
gives me all the information out. Basically, what the information that the dashboard is showing me, it shows it me shows it to me into you know in the uh, CLI, you know that I succeeded. How long did it take? What the different parameters we passed in? You know what what was the workspaces that were utilized? And then what were the specific task runs that were created? And we can view that over here also. So every time you create a pipeline run, the pipeline is actually going to uh, create a task run for each of these different tasks, right? So you can see that here too. And we'll actually go in and, um, uh, you know, do some analysis in the annotations later on, just to show you what that looks like. Um, so what I'm going to do is, uh, so I'm just going to export this value. So all this is doing is it's going to pull out, so it's going to run it here too, actually, just to show you. All it's doing is it's going to pull out, so specifically it's pulling out the app image. So what I want to know is like, hey, where did I store this image and what, what's the name of it? Right, so it's uh, webinar demo nine right there, and that's what it shows here. So all it's doing is, just, you know, a JSON path and pulling out that information for us. So I'm just going to copy that, save it into an environment variable, and then but the other other useful tool is called Crane. Um, Crane is allows you to kind of visualize what's happening in your uh, registry uh, in a specific image, and it kind of shows you like, hey, what's stored there. So in this case. I didn't give it a I didn't give it a tag, so I stored it as the latest. Um, and then right here, the two important pieces that we want to look at is the at this is the actual attestation, the provenance file, the document that we created, that change created. And here's that signature. So this is a signature that changed use in order to sign. So at you right. So use that uh, secret signing key in order to do the signing. So that's what that is. And then of course, uh, let me go back up here and then uh, just do a cat again. So the next piece is the cosine verify. Um, so this piece, all it's going to do is, uh, you know, verify that the image was signed, right? And it's going to use the, the signing secret because that has our private key in there. So it's going to use that to verify, hey, um, has it been signed uh, by our, our secret? Uh, or um, has it been signed properly by our private key? So it's going to use a public key in order to verify that. So it goes in and uh, verifies the claims. Yes, cosine ver validates all the signatures are verified against the public key, right? Because uh, we signed it with that private key, so the public key can verify that it has been signed. And our, we're using full shoe in this case as the root certificate. So we can verify, yes, the image has been signed uh, and we trust it. And I think in the coming, uh, the coming uh, demo that Jim is gonna show, we're gonna, he's gonna talk about, hey, how can you use this in terms of an admission controller? To make sure that you know your image, you know before it goes into a production stage or something, you want to verify that the image is actually signed and you trust it, right? So Kai, uh, Kiverno uh, is going to help us in that regard. So that that's an admission controller coming up. So the last piece uh, here is going to show is uh, verify the attestation. So it's going to verify a provenance document that got created. It gets also signed, right? So you want to make sure that that also validates against the you know the private and public key. Um, so this gives us a little bit of confidence uh, saying like, hey, nothing, nothing changed in transit, right? Nothing changed uh, while it got stored to the OCI. So all that stuff passes. So here is the actual payload. Um, so this is the actual, I'm going to go down here to here. This is the actual provenance that gets created by, by chains. So what, and it's base 64 encoded. So I'm just going to do a quick go of this and then wait for it to go all the way down. And I'll just do a base 64, decode that, and then pipe it to JQ, right? So we can actually visualize, this is the actual provenance, you know, how the provenance file looks. Um, so you can see it's in the type, in total type that I, that I spoke about before, that Salsa currently supports. Uh, you can see here Salsa provenance version 0 0.2. What was that object that got created? So it's a webinar demo nine image that I created, the digest of it. Uh, what was the builder? It says it's chains. And then if you go down here, it gives you specific information. Um, so in our case, this 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 task right here was the one that did the actual uh, image building. Um, so you can see all the different parameters. So all the parameters that are defined here on that uh, on the left side are going to be defined here. So app image, builder image, all that kind of stuff kind of lines up one to one. And then after that is the specific steps. So uh, you see there are three different steps in here. So you can see what did each step do? Um, so it gives you all that information, what commands got ran, what arguments got passed in there, was there any kind of environment uh, environment stuff that got, got used within it, what image got used, it gives you all that kind of information. So it basically gives you an outline of 
how was this image created? So when you go back, you know, let's say once once this image has been published into an OCI registry and you want to go in and verify like, hey, I want to know exactly how this image was created. Do I trust the method that the, you know, the, the developer used uh, to publish this image? Do I trust the way that they created this image is secure? You know, there's no vulnerabilities. So you can go in and actually see every step that it took and uh, ver validate everything came into place. And there's some other tools along the way you can use to verify. So uh, the other, other thing that I've been uh, working with is in Toto, and that can be used to like validate, hey, all these steps came in proper order and all that kind of stuff, but that hasn't been um, incorporated yet into chains. Hey, Parth, quick question. Um, sure. Where, where does the like signing certificate play? Like, does it play a role at all in that provenance document? Uh, or the provenance metadata? Yeah, so it's, uh, so let me go back. So in, um, I believe, so it's, so this document itself is stored in OCI. So when I did the crane, uh, let me go back up here. So if I go back and do the cosine verify attestation, right? Um, in here, the signature is also stored. Uh, so when it does this, you can see down here, there's a signature. Uh, let me scroll up here. So there's also this sig right here. So this piece is that, that's our signature. I'm sorry, this whole thing. Um, so that's where that it's, so what it's doing is taking that payload and actually signing that whole payload so that nothing, you know, so you can, you can validate like, yes, you know, there's nothing that's changed since I signed it. So that's where that signature comes into play. So it signs the image as well as it signs the, uh, the, the, the prominence document. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the last piece that I want to show is if you remember, I, I stored it as in both OCI um, and I stored it as a tecton, right? As storage, uh, dual, dual storage. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, so specifically, I want to look at the image that I got that, uh, the one that did the image creation, which is going to be the build tax task runs, right? So I'm just going to do a, do that. So it's going to give me the task runs that I ever used. So specifically, it's going to be built. At the, right? This one is the fetch from Git, which we don't care about. Um, I specifically care about this one, which is the one that's doing the actual image creation. So if I do a get the task runs and specify that, and I'm just going to do a output in YAML. So if you scroll up here, uh, so you can see what was stored in OCI. If you remember when I did the cosine um, verify attestation, here's that same payload got, got added to the annotation. And down here, here is a signature. So that here's a signature piece right there and a signature gets added here too. So it's basically two different ways of uh, storing the, you know, either the signature as well as your attestation, uh, the provenance document and, you know, Tectony chains here says is signed. Um, so you can have multiple different copies of it just in case, right? Uh, and, and of course the best place to store it in this case, especially if you're creating images is within the OCI registry. So if, you know, in the future, uh, you know, like we probably, you would want this to be a much wider adoption, right? So you would want to do this internally, but at the same time, you would want your suppliers to be using this method also, so that when you pull down their images, right, you can do, you know, cosine verify and cosine verify at stations and all that kind of stuff so that you can trust exactly, you know, that image that they created, can you trust it, right? Based on the public key, right? Based on their public key, you can validate that image has been signed with their private key and you can verify the attestations and all that kind of stuff. So it helps you, you know, create a much more secure, uh, you know, software secure factory basically. Uh, and yes, I think that's about it. So let me know if there's any questions or um, anything else I can go over. Let's see, I don't see any pending questions in the uh, Q and A feature. Folks, if you have any questions uh, for Parth, go ahead and put them in now. Give that a, a few seconds. I'll ask a, a really, really dumb question. Um, but uh, for my own thing, looking into a lot of these things, it's been a while since I've looked at container image signing in any way other than like notary, like V1, like a long time ago. And a lot of the complexity there was in kind of the key management in a, in a team setting, you know, when you've got say, 50 developers that are all working in and around this. And one of them might build the image today. The, another one might build an image tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, 
it looks like there's some with with cosine and some of the newer tooling that there's a lot kind of wrapped up in manage that key management piece right um, is there anything like top of mind is from like a best practices perspective that 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 is clear for how to manage that sort of thing in a team environment or do the tools like cosine make that sort of moot at this point so specifically uh one that we're dealing with currently is we're actually using vault so what we did is right you have your keys uh, stored in vault and we're actually using spire uh, in order for it to authenticate and grab that specific key so that the key actually never leaves right you do all your signing um, within vault but the key never actually leaves vault um, so that makes it easier so i think using you know kms and vault and all that kind of stuff i would say that integration with chains and cosine makes it a lot easier. So that's the piece that, especially in a team environment, uh, that's a way to go forward with it. So just to reiterate back a little bit, make sure I understand that is you would essentially probably generate a key per per project or, or per image or something along that line, have it stored in a KMS and then use some type of interface that, that unlocks that key in a delegated fashion, essentially. Right. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, great. I didn't see any other questions come in uh, during that exchange. So I think we'll go ahead and call it, Parth. All right. That was thank a great you. presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, okay. Well, moving on. Next up, we have um, Jim Baguadia, the co founder at Nirmana and a key Verno maintainer. And he's going to be speaking to us about managing Kubernetes workloads and clusters with key Verno. All right. Thanks, Alex, Joe, and team. Um, yeah, so I'm going to kind of deep dive into Kiverno, and this is, um, I guess, whoever planned the sessions did a fantastic job because I'm going to pick up almost where part left off. <laughs> there you go, Alex. Uh, yeah, so I'll kind of show what happens, you know, once you use things like Tecton or GitHub Actions or other tools to build, sign, attest images, how do you make sure what's running in your clusters is secure, right? And um, both in terms of admission controls as well as background scans and things like that. So just, I think um, Alex already quick introduced me. So other than being at Nirmata, you know, I'm also a Kiverno maintainer, work in the policy working group, multi-tenancy working group, and, you know, kind of getting involved in some of the six store projects as well. Uh, so lots of interesting things going out, just reach out on either the Kubernetes or CNCF Slack if you're interested in any of these. Um, so I'll start with just kind of describing why policies matter, right? Because as a developer, I always kind of thought of policy as a bad thing, right? I mean, look, it's there. I know, you know, I have to kind of deal with it, but it's not something I'm going to look forward to working with. Uh, but now, you know, obviously being part of Kiberno and understanding how they fit into Kubernetes, uh, partly my attitude has changed over there, and I feel that there's a lot of benefit uh, policies can bring. And then we'll talk about why Kiverno versus other tools in the ecosystem, uh, deep dive into the architecture, touch on how Kiverno plugs in into admission controls. Um, Joe mentioned, you know, the, uh, the admission control threat model, which we have been working with SIG Security and others for an, uh, a security review on Kiverno, and even, you know, things like fail, fail open, fail close, making sure all of that is you know, robust and works well for production deployments. Uh, we'll take a quick look at features. I'm not gonna go through all the features, there's just too many. By the way, there was a great live stream this morning, a CNCF live stream uh, where a couple of uh, the other maintainers, Chip and Shooting, went through 1.6 features and some of the new introductions. Uh, so check that out if you're interested in deep diving into features. But then I'll do a demo, again, more focused around supply chain. We'll try and cover some basics of pod security, but we'll go into uh, how you can validate some of the attestations, et cetera. So starting with why policies, right? And I love this tweet, uh, which uh, a Kubernetes admin in a, uh, who's very active in Falco and some other communities posted. Um, so clearly uh, there's, a, there's a desire uh, and there's a need in the Kubernetes community to have policies. And really the way I started thinking about policies is this is more kind of a codifying a contract between different roles of, in Kubernetes, right? So if you think about who, who cares about a Kubernetes cluster, 
obviously it's developers trying to deploy and you know, manage their workloads. It's the ops team trying to manage a bunch of shared services, um, as well as you know, um, make sure that the cluster itself is functioning well. And it's the security team that wants to make sure that you know, we're not introducing new security holes and new problems, right? So policies start acting as a contract. And where, where, where this gets really exciting is, what if a policy were just a Kubernetes resource? So I could do everything I can with the Kubernetes resource to a policy. I can put it in my CI CD pipeline. I can manage it just like I do with other infrastructure or uh, workload resources. Uh, I can apply customized kubectl, all of that to it, right? And why shouldn't it be that way, right? And, and that was really the idea and the thinking behind Kiverno to make policies native to Kubernetes and to make them super easy to fit in with all of the other tooling, all of the other goodness in Kubernetes itself, right? So certainly a lot of things policies can do. The basic is, you know, our kind of motivation is let's make Kubernetes secure by default. So you bring up vanilla Kubernetes and, you know, with a couple of commands, we should be able to get to a really good level of security right away, right? And, and with Kiverno, you, you'll see how, you know, fairly straightforward, how easy it is to get that. And we'll look at some examples. The other thing is there's just so many best practices, configurations, there's new CVEs coming out. It seems like every week we see something in a new show up. Uh, I think last week it was something on nodes with, uh, you know, like uh, uh, having some privilege escalation. Uh, of course, there's other sort of, you know, we've seen other CVEs like with different, you know, also on load balancer services, things like that. This Kubernetes, you know, one of its, uh, the reason why it's so powerful is because of its declarative configuration management. You can kind of, if you want to control every last detail of how your deployment or your pod or everything behaves, you can. But, you know, most of these things, uh, you know, we typically deal with like 20% of those configuration knobs and the other 80% we ignore or we just leave as defaults, right? So making sure that's properly configured, policies are great at kind of filling that role. And then like we talked about separating the concerns across different roles, just reducing complexity for, you know, developers, new, new folks coming into Kubernetes, making sure best practices are applied. And and the other interesting thing is policies are not just about enforcement and validation. Security, of course, is a primary use case, but they're also about you know, automation. So with Kiverno, you can mutate, you can generate resources on the fly, which kind of leads to some very interesting use cases from multi-tenancy, as well as just automation of bits and pieces. Uh, there's a great presentation from one of the Kiverno maintainers who manages, uh, you know, at, uh, he's at Ohio Supercomputers. He manages an HPC deployments where he's wired up, you know, their LDAP service to Kiverno to generate, you know, HPC kind of on demand for things like Jupyter Notebooks, et cetera. It's completely self-service, completely automated and, and driven through some of these policies, right? So some fairly interesting use cases emerging there. All right, so why, you know, now that we're, talked about, okay, why might you want to care about policies? Uh, why Kiverno? Why not things like, you know, OPA, Gatekeeper, other tools that have existed, right? So first off, Kiverno, just uh, this question comes up. So it means govern in Greek. And so that's why we named it Kiverno, because I guess going with the whole Kubernetes naming theme uh, itself. But really what we wanted to, the re motivation for the project um, with Kiverno is, Again, make this extremely native to Kubernetes, um, make it able to handle any custom resource without any additional training. So if you kind of look underneath the covers, Kubernetes uses um, you know, a open API v3, uh, and it uses structural schemas within the API server. So really the way you can think about this is with tools like Kiverno, your API server is now programmable, right? So you can not only with CRDs, of course, you can extend it and bring in types, but here you can bring in behavior along with those types in a very declarative form as well. And Kiverno, the whole idea is make it very simple. You don't need to learn any complex programming language or anything like that. Uh, and again, very usable within the Kubernetes ecosystem, uh, even, even to kind of you know, have policies that generate policies, 
policies that automatically mutate or write the things. So some fairly complex use cases that we can handle, right? So one of the things we talk about in this question, uh, you know, I got asked is like, okay, you mentioned Kubernetes native, but what does that even mean? And is that just a marketing term and um, does it matter, right? As an end user, why should I care if something works that it's Kubernetes native or not, right? So it really depends on your viewpoint and what problem you're trying to solve. So the way I kind of just describe this and think about it is there's different, you know, you know, different levels of being Kubernetes native. So if you have any tooling that's created for Kubernetes, you could claim, of course, that that's Kubernetes native, it works with Kubernetes, that's why we're calling it that. Um, the next level up you could go to is to say, well, it uses Kubernetes APIs, it can talk to the API server. So maybe that's some, you know, level of Kubernetes native. But really where it gets interesting is when you start acting as part of the control plane, when you're extending Kubernetes, that's when really I feel it's sort of, you know, the, the, the next level of Kubernetes uh, native kicks in, which is level three here. And, and if you can then understand, and what Kiverno does is it knows about things like owner references. It understands the pod and pod controller pattern. So with all of these things, the whole idea is make it really simple to write policies that can leverage this, right? And then the final level is once you get to those structural open API schemas, and Kiverno, by the way, it queries every open API schema in, the, in your cluster, so it automatically learns about these custom types. Even for example, part just went through um, you know, Tecton. Tecton is a bunch of CRDs, of course, and Kiverno policies can be now used to secure Tecton itself, provide multi-tenancy for Tecton, things like that, which is otherwise fairly complex to do. And the reason why it can do that is because it understands the, again, the schema, how Kubernetes works and what a Kubernetes resource looks like, right? So some fairly interesting and you know, flexible use cases emerge once we focus the problem set to Kubernetes itself. Now, of course, what's happening in the overall industry is also Kubernetes is very rapidly becoming the universal control plane of everything, right? So we just saw a demo of using Kubernetes for CI CD. There's projects like Crossplane, which use Kubernetes for IAC almost as a replacement for Terraform. Uh, Cluster API, CAPI uses Kubernetes to create clusters. Uh, there's ACK, which uses Kubernetes to create AWS services, be it RDS, S3, whatever you wish, right? So now with everything moving to becoming a Kubernetes resource, it's a very, you know, Kiverno becomes this policy engine, again, which is ideally suited to those type of use cases, right? So just to kind of summarize on that, right? The whole goal, again, make policies easy to write, easy to manage. Um, and make sure that, by the way, one of the things too is, it's not just about the policies, right? It's the policy results. So how do you see those? And even in, for Kiverno, that's a Kubernetes resource. The policy report itself is a Kubernetes resource. So that makes it easy to process this, use Kubernetes APIs to pull those reports. Uh, of course, Kiverno also has metrics and Prometheus, uh, puts out events, things like that to make things simple as well. Um, validate mutate, generate are the three rule types. And we'll look at some of these in detail examples. And then supporting custom resources, understanding open API v3 schema, other Kubernetes, you know, kind of patterns, idioms, uh, all of those uh, that come, um, you know, with, uh, with the release itself. And, uh, and this is not, you know, static in time. Uh, just to give an example uh, with pod security, right? So we went from PSPs to pod security admission, uh, which is coming, which is you know soon to be. Now it's currently beta, I believe in one two three or one two four, and it's soon to be. It'll probably be it's targeted for GA and one two five. So being you know Kubernetes native and focused on Kubernetes, Kiverno will embrace you know pod security admission. Will support that, but then also provide additional flexibility, additional value above and beyond that. And I'll I'll show you know what some of the pod security policies look like in there. So again, and, and there's several, you know, uh, if you Google Kiverno uh, versus OPA, et cetera, there's some pretty interesting teardowns. There's, there's good pros and cons on both sides, right? So of course, do your research, make your choices uh, based on what your use cases are. And, you know, there's some, the good thing is in the community, in the ecosystem, there's several good tools that exist 
uh, with solving this policy management uh, issue itself, right? Um, so let's kind of switch to, you know, look at some of these uh, use cases and I'll, I'll show some of examples of these policies uh, to, to go deeper into how Kiverno operates itself. So the main use case, you know, and the primary use case, of course, is again, making Kubernetes secure for both pods and workloads, um, having best practices, fine-grained RBAC comes up fairly often. Like for example, you know, uh, this conversation also applies to Tekton or other similar Kubernetes projects, uh, which, you know, tend to kind of look at the entire cluster. So if you want to run multiple of these, if you want to have, you know, more, um, whether it's namespace space, multi-tenancy, things like that, you can now do this with Kiverno. Uh, even proper hygiene, like auto labeling, sidecar injection, uh, having rules to do something like an IFTTT. So you're chaining together various actions, right? So, and then the image signature verification and attestation verification, uh, which I'll showcase, um, you know, which kind of dovetails into what Park just showed as well. So let's, uh, before we go through some policy examples, very quickly, you know, where does Kiverno fit? Um, so Kiverno acts as a, you know, admission controller. The slide got jumbled a bit. Let me just pull this up. Um, so it acts as an admission controller. Oh, that didn't help. All right, we'll just get rid of this title. So it acts as an admission controller and of course, everything in Kubernetes goes through the API server, right? So um, I, I think it was Joe mentioned earlier that even, even things like if you're trying to exec into a pod, guess what? There's a connect request that goes to the API server and Kiverno can validate that. And you can check and see exactly what somebody's trying to do as they exec and allow or you know, deny uh, based on your policy sets, right? So some extremely powerful things are possible once you kind of see what the information in an admission request. And Kiverno has the ability to either mutate, uh, validate and block or validate and audit, which means that it will allow that resource to go through, but it will create a policy violation, or it can even generate resources based on triggers. So you can start doing the things like, okay, if somebody adds a label on a namespace, um, maybe you have, you know, uh, for data protection, you need a backup schedule, so your developers just have to add a particular label to a namespace and you can automatically generate a Valero or you know, like a cast and schedule for that, right? So things like that now become programmable, uh, which otherwise is a you know, series of tickets or handoffs or other kind of complex coordination, right? Um, so, and, and when Kiverno installs, I mean, it, it basically you know, it self installs, plugs in into the API server but it also generates the important things here are this validating webhook config, the mutating webhook config. And here, this is where, you know, also going back to the security model, uh, Kiverno policies fail close by default, which means if in a policy you do not, you buy, if you just have the default values, if, that, if Kiverno is not reachable and, you know, you cannot, you know, the admission server cannot ask Kiverno for a decision, it will fail. You can, of course, you can turn this off and you can say, I want to fail open, but then you have to manage which policies, like for pod security, we definitely recommend failing close. For other best practice, you might want to fail open, right? So it's very tunable. In Kiverno, you just set that up on a per policy basis and Kiverno takes care of the underlying configurations for you, right? So it's not, uh, not very complex and not hard to manage at all. Uh, there's other, we do have a security section in the docs. If you go check that out, it covers every aspect of the threat model and, and shows what's important, how which roles Kiverno needs. If you're generating resources, you need to, of course, give Kiverno permission to be able to generate that resource. Uh, so it installs with minimal sort of a least privilege model, and then you can add permissions as you require to do other things. All right, so let's take a look at what a policy uh, in a structure looks like, right? So policy is really kind of a collection of rules and rules can match and exclude resources on a number of different criteria, um, both internal and external. So it could be things like kinds, names, labels, namespaces. It can, Kiverno can do an API server call and check for various things. So if you wanna say like, okay, if my namespace has more than one load balancer service, don't allow the next one, right? So all of that is extremely simple to do. 
You can even, Kiverno populates autofills in like the user groups and roles. So beyond what's available in the admission request, Kiverno will fetch all of the groups that that user making the request or the service account making the request uh, has access to. And we'll put that in the, uh, in, in the policy uh, context. So you can then write a rule which can say, uh, hey, I'm gonna allow or deny if, you know, this, this change for this group of users, right? So things like that become fairly simple to do with these policies. And then policies can either mutate, verify. Um, and, and the reason why it's ordered in this way, by the way, is the mutating webhook runs first. Uh, then um, in Kiverno, the verify images is a kind of a hybrid, right? Because not only does it verify the image signature and other attestations, but Kiverno will also replace your tag uh, with a digest. So as soon as that image is verified, it locks it down to a particular digest. And after that, you, you know, that image is pinned to that digest in your cluster, which is extremely important. This was another kind of you know, vulnerability which was reported. It's, it's a little bit tricky to, to kind of exploit, but it's still possible. And there, somebody, because image tags are mutable, uh, it, that's something that folks could take advantage of, right? Um, and then it will run the validation rules after that. And then finally, the generate rules run uh, in, in the background, right? So the, that doesn't block the admission request because at that point, the admission request can return uh, and then you, it can go and generate resources after that. So what does the rule look like, right? So the idea behind Kivana rules is if you understand the structure of a deployment or a pod, the rules, much like customize, takes the approach of it mimics the resource that it's trying to customize with an overlay pattern. Kiverno follows that same approach, right? In fact, you can even apply strategic merge patches, which also customize supports, or you can apply JSON patches, and we'll see some examples of that. But here's a very simple rule, which is adding into a pod. And by the way, by default, if you write a rule on a pod, Kiverno will automat automatically generate rules for deployment, stateful sets, other standard workload controllers, right? You can, of course, turn that off, but that's kind of the default behavior to, to apply these rules when the deployment is actually configured and not wait when the deployment creates the pod. Because if you wait till that latter step, you don't know what actually failed. The deployment succeeded, but the pod will never run. And it's really hard to troubleshoot unless you go look at the events and see what exactly blocked the pod, right? So those sort of things, Kiverno just again, as a pretty nice and you know, user experience tuned for Kubernetes. But this, this check, uh, all it's doing is checking for a particular label, which is a recommended label in Kubernetes. It's saying, hey, every pod should, should you know, have a name um, and or should in, have a label with the name. Uh, and Helm and things, of course, automatically install these type of labels automatically. But if you uh, just have GitOps, you're declaring or somebody's trying to run something in production, you can now either, you know, you can warn and um, validate this in dev test, but in production, you can enforce these type of best practices. So that was a validate policy. There's also several other things you can do. I mean, you can, uh, Kiverno, although we kind of say, well, it, it's not designed to be a programming language, it's not Turing complete, and uh, there's no intention of making it a Turing complete language. It can do a lot of you know, complex things you would ex uh, expect, like, like if then checks, uh, things like you know, matching with uh, wildcards. Uh, there's you know, operators built in into this, but it's all extremely declarative, right? So uh, for example, if you want to kind of you know, match a particular group of kinds here, and, and this is just saying, okay, just deny uh, if the uh, request, if any of these kinds match, right? Some other examples of how you can combine these operators with mutate rules, things like that, is you can say that if, you know, these parentheses just mean like a simple if check to say if the port starts with secure and then it's a wildcard, then I want it to be a particular, you know, value. So I can, this is, happens to be mutate, so it will automatically change it, right? If not, if it doesn't, if it's not present, the next thing is checking to say if it's not defined in the YAML, uh, in my resource manifest, then I want to insert that particular port number itself, right? So some pretty, you know, powerful things you can do and very, very simple declarations. Um, there's also with generate policies, you can kind of um, 
clone resources from uh, from uh, your your own resource. So you can have like a prototype resource in a namespace, and then you could tell Kiverno to clone resources on some trigger. Like for example, a common trigger is when namespace gets deployed, automatically put in network policies like this is a default deny, uh, or you can put in when a service gets created, maybe you wanna create like a Istio service or a Cilium service uh, for each Kubernetes service, right? So the one other interesting pattern is this allows you to, you don't have to give developers access then to cluster-wide resources, but you can use Kiverno to generate these cluster-wide resources on behalf of developers, right? So it's a nice, nice way to say, okay, just when a developer creates a particular resource or adds a label or changes something, you're automatically tuning some cluster behaviors on their behalf uh, using Kiverno policies. So image verification, and we'll take a look at this. And this again is just using static keys. There is also, by the way, the question you know, Joe was asking on uh, key management, uh, there's an experimental mode in Cosign for keyless. Uh, so just like serverless doesn't mean there's no servers, keyless doesn't mean that there's no keys. It just means keys are now ephemeral and can be you know, generated on demand. Uh, so Cosign supports that as a, uh, it's an experimental feature, but it's moving quickly towards you know, 1.0. Um, and the idea there, so Kiverno uh, will support that as well. But here, you know, just using simple static keys, and you could have a list of keys. You could have policies which kind of and these or these. Uh, so it makes it super simple to check. Uh, and then there's also attestation checks, we'll, which we'll kind of look at, right? I'm going to skip over this. You know, there's a lot of features. Um, I, you know, you can kind of browse through the website. Just, uh, you know, there's, there's a policy reporter, which is built in, there's Grafana dashboards, there's other ways to kind of get external data. Um, and, and uh, you know, Kiverno, just if you go to the website, you will see all of this, um, you know, fairly well documented. If you go into the documentation itself, pick the rule type. So writing policies is where it goes into details. Um, so I'm not gonna cover this. I'll, you know, instead we'll go through some demos and look at things live. But I would highly encourage, you know, kind of going and checking this out uh, and seeing what Kiverno can do. Another kind of, you know, shout out to the community. We are at like uh, 102 custom policies. There's about 20 more, or these are sample policies created uh, by folks using Kiverno submitted, um, you know, to share. And this is a fairly you know, nice interface. Like you can go and check for what you want to do and see. Start with a sample. Uh, and see you know, how to kind of do things, right? So say, for example, if you go to best practices and say, you know, let's take a look at, I want to kind of maybe disallow some, some mounts, right? So these are policy examples of this and you can kind of take these and customize them as you need. They're also kind of sorted by which version those features were introduced in, et cetera, right? Um, I'm gonna show what, you know, the, just some basic policies with pod security. Uh, but let me let me go back and check and see if there's any other slides or things worth calling out. Um, yeah, so maybe uh, you know just to kind of I'll come back to some of the summary and on what we do. But let's dive in and go into a demo. I don't know if there's any questions so far, but happy to answer as we kind of go through. There aren't any pending right now. Uh, just as a reminder, folks, use that Q and A feature at the bottom of the interface if you have a question for Jim. All right. Okay, so I already have Kiverno running on this. There's, if you go in, a, in the docs, there's several ways to install Kiverno. The simplest way that I use for testing is just through the, uh, by pulling down the YAMLs itself. So it'll just quickly show what that command looks like. There is a Helm chart, which is on, you know, uh, Artifact Hub, so you can uh, go but uh, and install through Helm, or you can just kind of run this one liner and it'll pull down either for a specific release or just for the latest, if you wanna play with the latest, right? Uh, if you're, of course, putting this into production, we highly uh, recommend using the Helm chart itself uh, because both the chart and the manifest are version or going to release specific definition uh, and using that. Um, so anyway, so I have given or installed. I don't think I have any policies. Uh, let me, CPOL is just a short for cluster policy. I do have a policy and I'm just gonna delete everything. I don't want any policies right now. Um, 
And we'll start with just you know a cluster where if I do, let's say I do a kubectl run, and I can kind of run any pod. So actually, yeah, I'll just kind of let's let's try and run. Um, I'm not just going to run a, a you know like one of my sample pods, which I'll use for the image signing. But I want to show like you know by default, of course, Kubernetes um, doesn't have security configured. So one of the things that, which is an interesting site to play with if you haven't tried this. Uh, it's actually called, you know, the repo is called Bat Pods. Uh, it's uh, maintained by Bishop Box, and they have a bunch of, you know, pod configurations which uh, are not good, right? So these are not things you want to use in your production. But they like this one shows it runs with privilege, it runs with host pad, um, it, it, with host network, IPC, etc., right? So let's just to make sure that you know we in our cluster we are kind of, you know, allowing this. I'm going to go and grab this manifest and we'll just run this directly um, on my mini cube cluster, right? So So I think I yeah, I need the minus f. Let me put that and then we'll go ahead and so this should just run that deployment and pull it down and it uh, it got created, right? So as we expect. So let's delete that and I don't know, what did it call it? Okay, so it's everything allowed. So we'll just delete, deploy, and grab that name. So now I'm gonna, again, like with the goal of making things easy, let's go ahead and install the pod security policies directly just from the Kiverno website, right? And this is if you're if you're not running PSPs or some level of admission controller, and definitely check out you know what's what's coming in pod security admission. Uh, but you you know pod security admission will allow security um, at a namespace level or to allow you know different levels of privilege uh, based on the pod security standards uh, at the namespace level. But if you want more fine grain control, the recommendation is to use an admission controller uh, like Kiverno or Gatekeeper uh, to apply, you know, high sort of more fine grained controls, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pull down, and if you notice this command, I'm, it's it's grabbing a bunch of policies and then it's applying a customization. What this customization is doing is it's flipping these policies from audit to enforce mode. Um, so when when these policies are run in Kiverno, uh, they will actually you know block a bad deployment. So the next thing you know, of course, we want to check is to we'll try that same deployment which previously was allowed and see what happens, right? So you see here, if you're looking at the cluster policies, these are all coming in as enforce, and Kiverno will kind of the, the what it's doing in the background, it's taking the policy set and it's updating the you know webhook. Uh, to make sure that each one of these um, is now ready uh, to be configured and to be usable, right? So that typically takes a few seconds before they kind of go all, all into kind of ready or running state. So let's just check that one more time. I think most of them are running. Um, there's a couple still waiting like the host path and others. Yeah, so this shouldn't matter. This shouldn't matter either. So let's go ahead and try the deployment and see if we have most of them running at this point, right? So I'm gonna, again, run that exact same deployment we did before and see what happens. And as we expect, Kiverno just rejected that and it's telling us which rules failed. It's telling us, and, and by the way, uh, you know, if you notice the policies that, that you know, if you kind of go look at them, they're all written at the pod level, but we ran a deployment, right? So, and it's, that's why these rule names are saying autogen is what Kiverno generates internally and says, hey, you can't, this deployment is gonna try and create a pod which uses the host namespace, don't do that. This is also using a host path, it's using privilege, it's running as non-root. It's a lot of bad stuff in this, which we don't want to allow, right? So that's kind of just a very basic demo uh, again. And, but in, in a few commands, the point here is you can get to a nice level of security uh, fairly easily, right? So I'm going to just go ahead and delete all these policies and we'll now kind of switch to the supply chain use cases to kind of dovetail on what part showed before as well. Um, 
All right, so what I want to do is I'm going to use an image, and this is where, like previously, I think um, those, uh, I think, yeah, I was I showed the Tomcat image. So I have already this demo Java Tomcat image. It's got just one version. There's nothing else in the repo, right? So just again to show that this can run. Uh, so I'm going to do a kubectl run, and we'll just run this image. It should run. We don't need it running. Uh, but I just wanted to show that it's it's allowed. So we'll go ahead and delete uh, the Tomcat or a pod. And we'll now require that this pod be signed, right? So I'm going to apply this policy that I have. I have a few policies, and I'll show what this looks like. This is called check images. Um, I need my minus F here. And if you look at the policy, let me pull that up. This is all it's doing, right? So it's saying for any image that comes from my GitHub container registry, um, I want it to be signed by this particular public key. And, you know, and the other thing here, it's saying that I want to enforce this. Notice the failure policy has failed. So it's going to block if it's you know, the, the webhook. Um, if I flip this to failure policy as ignore, um, if Kiverno is down, it would allow that. But then this validation failure action, you can still have to enforce or uh, audit. If you set that to audit, Kiverno will also allow the resource to be created, but then it will create a policy violation in the background, which you can kind of pick up through your reporting tools, uh, et cetera, right? So very simple policy. And it kind of this, again, could be uh, things signed by um, you know, builders or machine systems, or you know, if you're using uh, Tekton or GitHub Actions, things like that, and you can verify uh, some details about your, you know, or your. That. So this is only verifying the signature. I'll show some other details after we kind of look at this, right? So to to before I kind of verify. Um, uh, so once I created this policy, let's try and run that same Tomcat image again. And if everything works, it should be blocked, which it did, and said, hey, there's no signature, so I'm not going to allow this image. So now what I want to do is I want to kind of go and sign this uh, image itself. And when I sign that image, what's going to happen, like Bart was showing as well, is cosign behind the scenes. And we can actually go check this in our image repo, is it's going to sign the image, and it's going to attach that signature to that digest. And it's going to push it up into my OCI registry. I can choose a different registry but just to keep things simple. You know, I'm kind of using the defaults where now my image is signed and that signature is associated with that particular digest, right? So once we have done this, let's go ahead and now try to run that image again. And again, if everything's configured correctly, now in this case, Tomcat should be, you know, we should be able to run it, right? Because it's signed, everything's good. Um, so that's how simple cosign and you know using uh, something like Kiverno make it to now sign and verify images. Um, of course, you still have to manage, you know, figure out your key management whether you want to use keyless, OIDC, or some other form of you know how you're going to do this. But there's a lot of flexibility, and because policies now are just Kubernetes resources, it's fairly easy to update and manage as well, right? And the other thing to kind of point out is um, with uh, Cosign, your signature is not associated to the particular registry. You can put your signature in a different registry. So you can put them in a central registry. You can even you know, kind of sign and keep that metadata external and, and share it in other ways so that you want to verify it in other ways. So there's a lot of flexibility compared to what we had seen previously in, in things like Notary v1 and v2. So, Simple example, but what? let's get a little bit fancier, right? So let's say I want to now kind of do things like, hey, my, you know, like one of the things Bart mentioned for Salsa is I want a two-person code review, right? Or let's say at least I want to make sure there's a code review and that code review happens. So this is an example of a policy that's checking uh, for an attestation in your OCI registry associated to your image digest um, to make sure that there's a review and this review happened by the right people. Now, by the way, one thing I should have pointed out is you're in, in all of these policies, we're just putting in data over here, but Kiverno fully supports like external data sources like config maps. 
So best practice would be you kind of push some of these to a central config map. You can update those config maps through other tools uh, as needed. And the policy is then data driven, right? So you don't have to kind of put this into your policy itself. But of course, if things are not changing that often, it's fine to sometimes you know, start with things in the policy. Um, so, so going back to you know, like attestations, one other example I want to show, and of course, uh, these days everybody's still kind of fig trying to figure out log4j and what, what to do about that, right? But imagine, let's say you know, we're in, in this kind of um, future state where all of us are producing things like software builder materials, SBOMs with our tools. And I, I actually just pulled like some great old script uh, from the Cyclone DX site to say, okay, what would it take to create an SBOM? Uh, for a Java project, right? And it was very simple. And in the Java project that I used, I did insert some log4j dependencies, right? So I have, in this case, you know, it's running some version of log4j. This is a software build of materials which uh, documents every, you know, e everything used in my project, all of its dependencies, the licenses, things like that. So once you have this, and if you can sign a test and push that data, in a verifiable manner. With the Kiverno policy, now you can do things like this. You can say, hey, if I'm running this particular image, I want to make sure that you know, uh, I, can, I have um, an attestation, which is an SBOM. And in that SBOM, I want to check and see if, if it doesn't have any log4j, that's fine. I'm going to allow it. But if it has log4j dot dash core is what I'm checking for here, then the version has to be greater than 217, right? So fairly, again, simple declarative way of managing this. By the way, these are James Path expressions. So if you're not familiar, like a lot of CLIs, like the AWS CLI, et cetera, uh, use a JSON query language called JMES Path or James Path, uh, which is extremely powerful, very, very fast and performant. Kiverno supports that as well. So you can then do things like this, where you're checking for a predicate type, and this is an in toto attestation. And you're saying, I'm looking for a type of Cyclone DX and I want these properties, right? So let's, let's see that in action. So what I'm gonna do, first I'm gonna configure this policy and we'll try deploying the Tomcat um, uh, in an image again. So let's see what happens there. I want, I think this is called check SBOM, yep. All right, so if I run this image, at this point, it should say that it can't really find, you know, there's no attestation, so it failed to fetch, which is what we're expecting, right? Because we haven't added any attestations into my image. So let's see what cosine again. Previously, we used it to sign and create an image signature. Now I'm going to use it to create an attestation. So this could be a build step. Um, either it's coming, you know, from tools like Tekton, or you can put this as a GitHub action, uh, or, you know, as a Jenkins kind of in your build scripts. Uh, you can have this in there as well. But all it's doing is it's saying, I'm going to take this predicate, this SBOM JSON, I'm going to attach that entire thing and, and you know, kind of um, push it up into my OCI registry itself, right? So once that happens, and if we go back to the image, let's see, we should get, previously we had signature. Now in the versions, I get this .att, which is the signed attestation itself. So, you know, uh, when part kind of showed, you know, what that would look like with, through cosine, you saw the entire payload, et cetera, right? But now what I want to do is I want to um, make sure that, you know, once I've signed and pushed that attestation, again, I'm going to go and run that Tomcat image and, and see what happens. So this time the error should be slightly, whoops, I don't want to run the signing image, wrong, wrong one. So, I'll run this command and it should pull that, but it's saying that the predicate did not pass, right? Which is slightly different. So what, what is that telling us? It's saying in this case that because if I go back to my SBOM, here my predicate is saying 214. Now let's pretend, and of course this is not something you should ever do manually, but um, if I'm a build system and I kind of update my dependencies and versions, let's say I go to 217, right? Which is the allowed uh, image, right? And so what I'm gonna do, let's go back to the, uh, to the attestation. We'll clear this one out. So by the way, cosine can also replace existing attestations or ideally you will be creating a different new version 
of your image, a new digest and attaching to it, right? But just for this demo, I'm gonna to attach to the same digest. So I wanted to delete this attestation. So we, we changed that to 217, um, which is allowed by the policy. And we're gonna sign it and push it again, right? So I'm gonna run that same command again. We'll push the attestation and then we'll try to pull that image, make sure that Kiverno can kind of verify and see what's happening, right? So in this case, again, if everything passes, um, it should allow, you know, uh, the, so actually it seems like it didn't get the right, it was still pointing to that. Let's make sure we did the right thing. Oh, I changed log4j API, right? And we're checking for, if you recall, we're checking for log4j core. So, well, we know the policy works. So let's go ahead and change that. We'll try one more time. So I'm just gonna refresh, clear this out. Again, if you were doing this in a real world system, you would be building a new version of your image and making sure that these are immutable and attaching to that. But let's just go ahead and run that cosine command again. Um, push that, so that should push the attestation. And we'll give this another shot. And this time, if everything runs correctly, we should see that, you know, that pod is created, right? So it passed both the signature check, the attestation check, and this was allowed. Now, keep in mind, Kiverno also, once things are allowed, and if you find something new and you change your policy, like your, your SBOM should never change, but the vulnerability scan results will change, right? A new vulnerability is found. Kiverno can then use that data and can show you in your cluster where some of the violations are because of new vulnerabilities. So this makes it super powerful to do these kind of complex, you know, attestations and checks. And these could be anything. It could be code reviews, could be, um, you know, things like, you know, like we just saw with S bombs. So it's really, and, and there's more and more tools coming out, which are just like Tekton is, there's other tools uh, also emerging to be able to do these type of things in your CI CD pipeline itself, right? So, so one, yeah, one quick picture I wanted to show on that. And you, when you kind of think about Salsa, Salsa is really focused very much uh, on the CI CD pipeline and getting to Salsa level three or four is all about how you're securing your CI CD pipeline. But really the value here is only if you're using comprehensive policies end to end. So what you wanna think about is that deploy time, admission control, and as well as runtime, make sure that you have the right policy enforcement in your clusters, um, both your, you know, your pipeline clusters as well as um, in production itself, right? So this is uh, what you know, I will kind of just demonstrate it with Kiverno in this case. All right, so just to quickly summarize and wrap up on Kiverno, the whole goal of the project is to be a very native to Kubernetes as an admission controller. You saw with a few commands how easy it was to get to pod security, to do even very complex things like image signature verification, uh, attestations, into attestations, things like that. Um, Kiverno also comes, by the way, with the full-fledged CLI. So you can run it offline. You can also point the CLI to a cluster. You can kind of um, also apply, you know, there's a test command to as your authoring policies, which makes it super easy to write and check for policies. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, complex processing, you know, that Kiverno can do. And this continues to expand, like things like iterating over, you know, nested elements, checking for uh, API server data, checking for config map data, all of this is built in. Uh, but still, the whole goal is to make it super easy and not really require, you know, kind of a, any complex language to be able to get to this level. Um, so the community just continues to grow. I think the last time we checked, we were at about almost like 500% growth year over year. So it's fantastic to see that we're up to almost 2K GitHub stars uh, just in one year or so. So uh, definitely excited to see all the momentum uh, and all the adoption of Kiverno. Come say hello at, you know, uh, on the Kubernetes Slack or in any of our meetings. We have weekly contributor meetings if you're interested in, you know, kind of diving in into the code. We have monthly community meetings for users uh, where we talk about new features, demos, things like that. Um, there's also a Kiverno certification through Nirmata. 
right? So as you kind of get the, we want to kind of test your knowledge, see how, you know, to, and this, by the way, we're extending the certification to kind of have, you know, just a live component as well. So you'll get a sandbox cluster. You can play around with policies. You can check things out. It's a great way to kind of learn and, you know, upskill in this area. So that's all I had. And, you know, sort of, uh, I hope we have some time for Q&A, but happy to answer any questions or talk about anything else uh, relevant to this. Uh, no questions in chat or the Q&A section thus far, um, but we will definitely hang around. If anybody does have anything, um, um, we'll be hanging around for the social session in just a few minutes. So um, we'll go ahead and start wrapping up the, the normal meeting here. Uh, again, thank you, Jim. Thank you, Parth. Uh, great content. Things paired up very well, almost like they were planned that way. So thanks, <laughs> Alex. Uh, <laughs> um, and then as per usual, um, call for speakers. If anybody has any topics that's near and dear to their hearts that they want to come and talk to our community about, um, uh, even if you need help putting together, forming a presentation or anything like that, please reach out. Um, or if you just have specific topics that you'd be interested in hearing speakers come and uh, bring to our community, please reach out and let us know. You can contact us on the Tech 404 Slack um, in the specific uh, Kubernetes Atlanta meetup channel in the Kubernetes Slack uh, or on our KHATL GitHub repo, uh, as well as our meetup page. So no excuse to not be able to get something that you want to hear about to us. Um, thanks again to um, uh, Selzloff for the sponsorship and everything uh, with the Zoom webinar and such. Uh, and thanks to everybody that came out to the meeting today. Uh, always great to see uh, people come out in force. Uh, especially those that stay to the end. Uh, so thanks everybody for coming. We'll wrap this up for our January 2022 KHATL meetup. Uh, please hang around for the social time. Thanks everybody. <laughs>